Where's the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I got a question for you. Is a midlife crisis inevitable? Well, I thought mine was until I realized all I needed was a purple sports car with a white leather interior and a handy little flatbed in the back called an El Camino, and it just went away. But unlike me, what can you do when you hit that midlife lull? The good news is today's discussion will help you to stop your midlife crisis in its tracks. To help break this down, we welcome from the Rock Your Retirement podcast, it's Kathy Klein. And from the Afford Anything podcast, she's probably going through her midlife crisis herself right now, it's Paula Pant. And finally, the guy who probably medicated his midlife crisis by flying a plane, it's OG. Plus, have you ever been curious what your friends and other influential people are investing in? During our Friday FinTech segment, we discuss public, which is looking to make the stock market social. We'll also make sure to magnify a listener's money. And of course, I'll share some of my sweet, sweet trivia. And now, a guy who can't even remember his midlife crisis because he's so darn old, am I right? It's Joe Saul Seahawk. Man, that was direct. I'm sitting right here, Doug. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamin Show for a Friday. Let me be the first to welcome you to the weekend. I am, am as I just mentioned, Joe Saul C. Hi. And across the card table from me, maybe I am getting old because I keep it reintroducing myself. It's uh, Mr. OG. Why don't I introduce you instead? It's not really that you're old. It's more like um, mature. Well, thank you, man. That's very, very nice not of you. Not in the sense of like being mature. Oh, just like mature as in, you know, how like if you go in the back of your fridge and you're like, oh, that's a mature bowl of coleslaw. <laughs> Delicious. Yeah, that's funny, dude. That's really funny. Is is that joke ever going to die? Will that ever yeah, die? No, yeah, no, sir. I don't. I, I don't know. You're like a mature bowl of coleslaw, Joe. Not easy, pal. And a woman in an undisclosed location. going to talk to her just so we can end that conversation. It's my friend Paula Pant from Afford Anything. I would say you age like a fine wine or like like cheese, all of those things that taste better with age. There it improve is. Improve with age. After yeah. You scrape the mold off. That's well, <laughs> easy, OG. Holy cow. Paula, how are you doing? I am excellent. How are you doing? I'm ready to start the weekend and not with, uh, not apparently not with OG and Doug. I'll stick closer to you, people that actually know how to give me a compliment. Much, much. Oh, well. <laughs> Thing. It's skills. And, and that's the beautiful thing about moving through life. That's a beautiful thing about age. You, you pick up various skills along the way, like basic social decorum 101. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, it's very polite, Paula. It's What's to that? introduce the guest who's going to carry this show from the Rocky Retirement Podcast. It's our friend, Kathy Klein. It's about time you got here, Kathy. <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure, <laughs> Joe. Aren't I the oldest one here? Well, I, I think I'm older than you. I don't know about that. And and you I never think- ask, by the way. That's not polite. Talk about polite. <laughs> hey, Kathy, how old are you? And then our next. <laughs> and by the way, how much do you weigh? <laughs> we just. That's true. Yes. That is true. But I'm having a birthday here in a couple of days. I'm not going to tell you the actual day, but I think I am older than you. Well, tell everybody about the Rocky Retirement Podcast because you guys are changing up the format a little bit. I understand. We are. So I started the show in 2016 when none of my listeners actually knew what a podcast was. You know, I would actually grab their phones and subscribe them. So that's kind of how it was. It's kind of like an encyclopedia. So anything they want to know about retiring that doesn't have to do about money, that's what we talk about. We talked about sex. We've talked about when you start, when your loved ones need to go into a nursing home. We've talked about losing your memory, which apparently I'm doing right now. We've we've talked about a lot of things on the show, but I have been getting bored with it. And so a few weeks ago, I announced that the show was going to change and I got a bunch of people 
sending me emails saying, oh, we love your show. We don't want you to quit. Now, I never said I was quitting. I just said I was going to change it up. And I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I was thinking that maybe I would podcast occasionally. I thought, you know what? I know what I want to do. I want to follow somebody who's a few months away from retiring. And we're going to follow her life over the course of a year. Oh, that's cool. And so, yeah, that's our new format. And I'm really excited about it. So I'm energized now that we've, we've made that change. I thought you said, Kathy, when you were changing the format, you're like, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in my mom's basement. We're going to have this show about nothing. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think that would be great. I'll just copy your show except for <laughs> what let's see, how can I change it up slightly so I don't get sued? Well, we would sure. never sue you. We wouldn't do that. <laughs> what is that, OG, that whatever's the the thing of the Imitation. thing? Imitation. Imitation. Yes, absolutely. Well, Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. There it is, Paula. Thank you. <laughs> right. I like mine. I'm not getting old at all. You know, thing is the thing of thing. You know, <laughs> you guys know. <laughs> the stuff yeah. in the place. Exactly. So we got a great show today. We got Kathy here. We got Paula. We got OG. Let's talk about our midlife crisis, shall we? Let's do it. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our piece today comes to us from the Mel Magazine blog. This is a piece called Your Midlife Crisis Doesn't Have to Be an Embarrassing Disaster. It's written by Chris Bourne. And today, as most weeks, we're going to have a celebrity reader. And you know what? This is a gentleman who does a great job of sending shows like ours, fantastic guests. A lot of the time, Paula, you know, you get pitched all the time people wanting to send you guests for the show. And I mm -hmm. don't know about uh, afford anything, but I'd say about 95% of the pitches we get are absolutely horrible. Yep. Same. <laughs> One guy who took the time actually to want to have a meeting with me. We talked forever about the show and now he just always seems to, he only sends me guests two or three times a year, but they always seem to fit is a gentleman from interview valet, Tom Schwab. And here is, my friend Tom Schwab reading today's piece. Your midlife crisis doesn't have to be an embarrassing disaster. Beyond doomed affairs and creaky leather jackets, here's what's really going on in the 40-something dip and how to avoid it turning into a cliche. Welcome to the den of horrors. Leslie Nope, the go-getting super administrator in the peppy sitcom Parks and Recreation, is telling it like it is to a group of costumed children at the Parks Department Halloween party. Where is all the scary stuff? Asked one of the kids perplexed. The scary stuff is invisible, Lee. Size note. Broken dreams. Disappointment. Achieving your greatest goal. Having it all fall apart and knowing that you'll never climb any higher. It's very possible that some of you have already peaked. It's all downhill from here, turkeys. Leslie's acute midlife crisis, triggered by losing her seat on the city council in season six, lasts roughly 24 hours. But for many who've reached a certain age and recognize her overwhelmingly feeling of futility, the despondency goes much deeper. The popular image of sudden onset middle-aged angst is largely that it affects career-minded, ambitious types whose inevitable lives stall and who react to this often juvenile, sad, or laughable ways. The most extreme example often do not fit this profile. And their sudden personal reinventions tend to assume one of two broad stereotypes. There's the classic pattern for a desire for new people sex and frantic youth recapturing, as that was experienced by journalist Robin Rinaldi who, after 18 years of faithful monogamy, decided to embark on a promiscuous open relationship experiment. Her year-long Wild Oats project proved great for her confidence, less so for her marriage. Or there's the updated, more mystical, eat, pray, love reaction, where you check out of all work and social commitments for the foreseeable future and vanish in a cloud of self-discovery. When Google's former chief financial officer, Patrick Pichet, announced he was taking 
early retirement at 52. For instance, he declared in a blog post that it was so he could go traveling with his wife and enjoy a perfectly fine midlife crisis full of bliss and beauty. It might be easy enough to multi-trip your way out of a midlife slump when, like Piché, you've been getting an estimated salary package of eh, three and a half million a year. But according to an MIT philosophy professor, Kieran Sieta, author of the book Midlife, A Philosophical Guide, while those with stellar career trajectories provide the most spectacular examples where they can plunge, it's a condition that can overtake any of us. And in a multiplicity of quieter, less obvious ways, for some, the emotional downswing is related to failure and thwarted ambitions. For others, it's regret about the road not taken and experiences they've missed out on. For others still, it might just be the crushing burden of everything that needs to be done just to keep life going. Tia's own midlife crisis kicked in soon after he turned 35 and seen many of his ambitions already realized. I had been building my life around demanding goals, and I'd been very lucky in how they turned out. But having got to where he wanted to be, he says, the basic structure of my life had now sort of dropped out, like the kids inducted into Leslie Nope's den of horrors. Satya found he'd peaked too soon and could see nothing ahead of him but a teaching classes, writing books, publishing papers, and professional plateau. And so far as I was driven, type A person, I could do more of the same. But it wasn't clear that the plan I'd chosen had any further peaks. This was pretty much the top. Luckily for him, he wasn't a multimillionaire tech exec who could cash it all in for the sports car and globe trotting, but a moral philosopher with a lot of expertise in prizing apart fuzzy concepts to explore their hidden meanings and qualities. And what could be fuzzier than the notion of a midlife crisis? What struck him was that his working life felt hollow, where it hadn't been before. Particularly troubling was the thought that, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to teach another class. And then if I work really hard, I could die, having published 40 papers instead of 37. That was the basic shape of his life, and it was disorienting. Second came the surprising realization that the issue wasn't really with his day-to-day themselves. He still valued his job and still believed that thinking about humans making choices and writing papers about these thoughts was, overall, a non-futile pursuit. Part of it was fear of death, he recalls, but part of it was that my approach to life was project-driven. That's what started me thinking. What's the mistake involved in orienting your life around projects, given that projects seem worthwhile? Visualizing hills, plateaus, summits, and slopes is a common theme around people trying to get to the roots of midlife panic. Satya says picturing his own lifespan in this way echoed the imagery used by Elliot Jacques, the Canadian psychoanalyst who was created with coining the phrase midlife crisis sometime in the late 50s. The term began to be popularized after the publication in 1965 of his influential essay, Death and the Midlife Crisis which studied the role middle-age turmoil consistently seemed to play in the careers of creative artists. In it, Jacques chose an image described to him by a 37-year-old patient. I seem to have reached the crest of the hill, and they're stretching ahead of me a downward slope, with the end of the road in sight. Far enough away, it's true, but there is death, observably present at the end. From this point on, says Jacques, this patient's plans and ambitions took on a different hue. He began his adjustment to the fact that he would not be able to accomplish in the span of a single lifetime everything he had desired to do. Much would have to remain unfinished and unrealized. In recent decades, the disruptions of middle age have become integrally associated with another image 
that claims to reveal overall contour of our lives. The much-touted theory of the happiness U-curve, which has emerged from a growing body of research looking into the development of well-being over lifetime, how people's age affect their happiness, essentially. Data gleaned from the International Life Satisfaction Survey since 1990 has uncovered a recurring pattern. On aggregate, people begin adulthood broadly happy in their early 20s. Happiness declines through the 30s, reaching a nadir somewhere between 40 and 50. And then overall contentment increases again in senior decades, until, of course, physical decline ultimately intervenes. Subjective well-being surveys are messy things data-wise. And this is not without its critics. But it's a pattern that has been borne out again very recently in a study by one of the early pioneers of well-being research. David Blanchflower of Dartmouth College, who has found evidence of a well-being shape in age in 132 countries, including 95 developing countries, controlling for education, marital, and labor force status. Scouring a vast amount of data, Blanchflower pegs the average emotional low point in human life at 47.2 years of age and unambiguously declares the happiness curve is everywhere. In coining the term, Jacques certainly saw it was a universal experience. He was inspired by the 14th century poet Dante, whose midlife crisis Jacques thought informed the journey through hell in the Divine Comedy. His 1965 paper goes on to discern middle age faltering in a wide panoply of artists, writers, and composers. Bach, Beethoven, Rossini, Michelangelo, Constantinople, Constable, Goya, Gagin, Dickens, all of their altered styles in later life, he puts down to a crisis experience at some point in their 30s or later. If our lives are destined to go into a little saggy in the middle, what can we do about it? Given that we can't all compose a timeless concerto or reintroduce a sense of purpose. On Satya's analysis, it would be a mistake to even try. When you're aiming to complete a project, he explains, you're always looking for satisfaction in the future. And you haven't gotten there yet. Once you've completed the task, that satisfaction is a fathom. Because the moment you finished it, it's done. And now it's in the past. Worst of all, he says, adding insult to injury is that in the present, when you are striving to complete a project, what you are doing is you're taking this thing that's meaningful in your life and the way you're relating to it is sort of destroying it, exhaust it, get it out of your life. For Satya, this is the pain at the heart of a midlife crisis and why a project-oriented approach to living makes you particularly vulnerable to it. Just about all of us tend never to question the idea that the things that matter in life is to get stuff done. But when getting stuff done takes the form of a finite and diminishing checklist, with each tick in the box, you're draining from your life another tank full of purpose. The key thing is to realize, says Satya, is that not all activities have the project-like structure. He draws a distinction between activities that have a clearly defined endpoint, which he calls telic activities, from the Greek word telos, meaning goal, and those that don't, the atelic pursuits that people engage for for their own sake. And these non-goal-oriented activities, he argues, are the key things to have in your life, which might ease you through a confrontation with mortality. Getting a promotion at work would be telic, he explains. Starting a family or getting married, they've got a goal or endpoint. By contrast, parenting doesn't have an endpoint at which you're done with it. It's an ongoing atelic activity. Spending time with friends would also be an atelic too, as would learning a musical instrument or simply going for a walk. Even your day-to-day -day work that can have positive, grounding, atelic qualities, he suggests. For Satya, 
philosophy had once been something that was led by the love of it. It was a telic, but by becoming a professional, it had been wrapped up into a structure where my love for philosophy now took the form of finish this article, get tenure, get a promotion. If you can identify the atelic activity that's been quietly enriching your life in the background and that you've sort of lost sight of, and you attend to it in a way that isn't distracted by the goals or endpoints that you might be aiming at, you might be onto something. Sataya sees that this is a rare opportunity to experiment in prioritizing journey over destination. As for his own speed bump, Sataya has been dutifully applying his own insight to his to-do list, and he reportedly generally positive results. But he also warns that it hasn't been easy. Perhaps, though, his biggest tip for anyone who finds they are dealing with a long, dark midday of the soul is simply this. Don't do anything reckless. And many of the things you're going through are just sort of inevitable features of life. Of course. There's disappointment and regret. Accept things as they are and find a way to see the value in what you've already got. And I do think there's real merit in that. Thanks to Tom. By the way, if you're promoting something, Tom's company, I think, is great. Is their interview valet will link to Tom and his company in the show notes. But guys, let's have a talk about the midlife crises because reading through this, Kathy, It really sounds to me if all of these popular artists, all these composers, all these people had a midlife crisis, it seems like it doesn't matter who we are or what age we are. You know, if I'm in my 20s, I'm listening to this. I'm like, what does this have to do with me? Kind of sounds like a midlife crisis is inevitable. Do you think that's true? Oh, Joe, you have no idea. I am going through my midlife crisis right now. Perfect. In fact, my whole show is about my midlife crisis. <laughs> so when I was reading this article, I started crying, I think. So I want to tell you about my midlife crisis. Here's some things that I've done. First of all, this year, I'm ending my 30-year financial services career, something that I really don't talk about on the show because, you know, my show's not about money at all. I'm changing the format of the Rocky Retirement Show. I've lost 15 pounds, although that was, I think, part of COVID. I'm reconnecting with my art. I'm changing how I run my MedicareQuick.com business. That's how I actually make money. I'm about to start yoga and Pilates to help with mindfulness. And because I've been thinking about my mortality... And I've been watching Mediterranean life and dreaming about <laughs> dreaming about moving to Spain, but I've never actually been to Spain. <laughs> so, does, that, does that mean, wait a minute, I love watching Mediterranean life. Does that mean I'm having a midlife crisis too? Well, I think we're about the same age, Joe, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Only so, you can answer that question. Well, I'll, gee, I'll ask you the same question. Do you think midlife crisis is inevitable? I don't know that it's inevitable. I think it's a get out of jail free card. What do you mean by that? It's, well, it's just something that you can hang. If, if you want to act like a fool for a period of time, you can you can just be like, ah, you know, yeah, it's a midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ah, you know, spent money foolishly. That's nah, a midlife crisis. You know, but I don't know. Is that your definition, Paul, of a midlife crisis? Or for you, is it more existential than that? No, no. I I have a different definition. First, I don't think that there's a singular midlife crisis. I think that there are multiple crises. I would call it more of that slump that happens in the muddled middle. And I I think that this is true of any anything that happens for a limited time, right? If you go to college for four years, freshman year, you're super excited. And then senior year, you're, you know, you have some mix of emotions going on, but there's that time like sophomore, junior year, where you're just kind of in that muddled middle, you're in that little bit of that middle time slump. Um, Even during the span of a day, right? Morning, you may have a bunch of energy. Evening, right before bed, you may have like another resurgence of energy, but then you've got that muddled middle in in the center of the day, that afternoon slump. And I think that midlife crises, plural, are expressions of that muddled middle for all of the things you're doing, whether it's your career or parenting or living in a city that, you know, you don't have the enthusiasm that comes from novelty and you don't have the surge of 
advanced nostalgia that comes from knowing that something is about to end. So you're just kind of punching the clock. But is that necessarily a bad thing, Kathy? Because as I hear Paula talk, I think, you know, this might be a good opportunity partway through whatever thing it is to say, what am I really doing here? Like, is this, is, is having a midlife crisis? I feel like we look at it as if it's a bad thing. Is it a bad thing or is it a good thing to reexamine? I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, all of the things that I listed that I've sort of done during my midlife crisis are things that I think are going to improve my life. You know, now I haven't gone out and bought an expensive car. I haven't done anything crazy, but I'm certainly examining my life. You know, is, is this the life that I want to lead? Is this how I want to spend my time? Do I want to spend my time doing one thing when I could be spending more time with my family? And so that is kind of what I'm doing is I'm reexamining who do I want to be when I grow up and I'm finally growing up. <laughs> I don't know. Th th that might mean you are older than me, than Kathy, because I'm, <laughs> I'm nowhere near growing up. Hey, OG, he talks about in this piece, the happiness U-curve, about how we seem to be very happy early in life. And then in, in the middle of life, our happiness goes down. And then for a lot of people, as they get older, they get they, they get happier again. Have you generally seen that with your clients, that the ones that are in the middle generally seem to be the most unhappy? I was going to say this sounds exactly like what Paulus just said. Yeah. <laughs> the, the muddled middle. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just a little bit more cynical view of this whole thing. It's just, it seems to me that you need to take every moment that you have to, you know, enjoy whatever it is you happen to be doing. There's a great book by George Leonard called Mastery. Do I know that you've read it? And it's all, the whole idea is, is that most of your life is on plateaus you know, most of your life is pretty flat. And then you have like little bits of time where you have this huge growth opportunity or you have this huge career progression or whatever, and then you plateau again. And his point in this is that, you know, the person who gets really good at a martial art or something like that isn't great because he or she had a whole bunch of these little spurts of growth. It's because they got really good at enjoying being on the plateau. You know, there's absolutely nothing wrong, I don't think, with having a a regular tempo to your day-to-day -day life or the regular tempo to your year. Now I will tell you now that my kids are back in school for the first time in six months, it's a little different, you know, cause they've just been around every day for over six months. It's just, it was just kind of weird that they were gone for a period of time. And, and I, I don't think that there was a time that they were gone for more than maybe, you know, a few hours since the beginning of, of March. So we just got to enjoy that. So I guess I think about it like from the perspective of if you are going through and you happen to be in this middle period, right? You're in this kind of U-shaped happiness, bottom of the U thing or whatever. It's like, this is just on you. It's just on how you want to process this information. And if you go, well, this just kind of, you know, it sucks and I got to go buy a sports car or something to get through my day. I don't know. It reminds me, reminds me have you seen that movie with... Um, Jason Sudeikis and um, we are the Millers. Yes. Where he's getting a haircut. Have you, have you seen that part? Hold on a second. See if I can pull it up. Yeah. You got to play. You got to play. I just saw this yesterday and this is what this reminds me of. I've never heard of it. Paula, have you heard of it? No. Paula, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, worry about it. I Don't use Paula as an example. I can use Paula a lot. I mean, uh, I it's <laughs> yeah, it's a movie. Jason Sudeikis comedian. And then uh, Jennifer Aniston's in it and the guy from the office, not my, Steve Carell, but the other one of the other guys. But anyways, basically, the story is, is that he's a 40 year old. He's you know, he's continuing to sell pot. That's what he did in college. And he gets robbed. And so his drug dealer supervisor, what you're going to call him, puts him on this mission to go get all this weed out of Mexico. So he decides to put together a fake family and they they RV through Mexico to get the weed as opposed to him just showing up, you know, at the border by himself, because he's going to be a little bit more inconspicuous if he's driving an RV with a whole bunch of, you know, with a wife and two kids. So are you talking about this scene, OG? Here, you take it. You're going to need it. You look like Eminem from 8 Mile. Mm -hmm. All right, go with her. Make sure she doesn't steal the money. And stay the f*** out of Hot Topic. David Clark? Okay. What are we doing today? Yeah. 
I say, give me some that says I get up every morning at 5.30 and commute for an hour and a half to some bull job where my off boss expects me to kiss his Don't. all day just so I can afford to keep my ungrateful screaming kids decked out and Dora the Explorer sh** and my wife up to her fat ass and self-help videos until the day I get up the courage to put a shotgun in my mouth. <clears throat> right here. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Every day I'm hustling, hustling, hustling. Just like the guy sitting behind him. That yeah. one. Just yeah. just like that. that one. But but if that's your thing, if you're if you're there and that's how you feel about stuff, that's on you, man. So you know, that's not because you're 40 or whatever. It's not the middle. Of course, I'm gonna live to be 140, so my middle's not till 70. So I can always get yeah. but, <laughs> but this is interesting, Kathy, based on what OG's saying, and we go back and people haven't read the piece, but also in the piece, like Tom read, it seems like a lot of this may be around being too goal oriented, right? Not enjoying the process and, and instead just being focused on the end game too much. That could be, but I have to take issue with what OG said. I don't hate my life. <laughs> I, I don't hate my life. I've never hated my life. I've been extremely, I would say, probably privileged in my life. And also I've set my life out to where it's simple and I don't have a lot going on that other people have. So but in here he, they're talking about people who are like, you know, going on, you know, sexcapades with, with other people, you know, I mean, right. they're talking about midlife crisis from the context of the colloquial version of this, of like, I'm going to go buy a race car, divorce my spouse, retire early and not thinking about it mindfully like you are. But later on in the article, it talked about how it, Virtually everybody goes through a midlife crisis, not just people who, and I think they said that somewhere in the article that I used to think I, whoever went through the midlife crisis was a chump. Where was that in the article? I, I remember Yeah, toward that, the bottom. Was, no, you're right. Uh, the guy said until he had his own, until he had his own, he thought that everybody that had one was a chump. And then I had one. <laughs> right. Exactly. I guess I've got a surprise waiting for me, basically. <laughs> All right, I got it. So, so not everybody that goes through one, you know, hates their life or doesn't like their life. I think it's, we start really thinking about what is important. But aren't you though, you Kathy, know? aren't you by definition then re-examining the goal and maybe thinking that the goal that you had is not the correct goal anymore? And maybe you've been a little too right. focused on it. Right. Maybe the goal is now to not have a goal. That's the new goal <laughs> you know, to not have one. Well, that is interesting. I mean, that, that seems to be kind of where he's headed is, is fewer goals. Absolutely. OG? No, I was just going to say, I can see this, you know, affecting a lot of super achiever people. You know, he does talk about a lot of people who have achieved a certain level of success. Every time that you accomplish something, you do get a little bit of that letdown, right? Like, oh, well, now what? And if, if you don't have the next thing kind of lined up or like we were talking about earlier, if you don't have the if you just don't enjoy the process of it or or reduced amount of goals or whatever you want to call it, then that can get very tedious. You can be like, well, I've done all this. I'm you know, I've got all this money or I've, you know, had these experiences and I'm bored. Now what? And people that always just kind of are looking at the front end of the of the cruise ship or never see any progress. You, all you see is just more horizon. It's just more stuff down there. The only way you get kind of perspective is to look from the direction that you came. And that gives you an opportunity to say, well, this is how far we've progressed. And so maybe that has a little bit to do with happiness also. Well, let's talk about that. I think to put a point on this, let's talk about what we think the solution is. Paula, we'll start with you. What do you think your solution is to this midlife crisis problem? Well, I think that, Many of these problems, the root of them is that a person is not doing what they actually wanted to do. And it might be because they caved to pressure from their family when they were in their 20s and making major decisions about their life, such as what career they would enter or what city they would live in, um, or whether or not they would get married and have kids. And if so, like when and to whom, you know, like it, it might be that they made those wrong choices early in life. Or we let um, a friend talk us into starting a podcast, something like that. I mean, exactly, not, not specifically, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> exactly. And now you find yourself sitting in a microphone going, how did I end up here? Like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> and so I think the root of the problem is, you know, people have made choices that were not true to themselves, maybe due to 
pressure, maybe due to necessity, uh, maybe due to the need to compromise, maybe some combination of all of the above. And as life goes on and as circumstances change and they're no longer feeling the social or familial pressures as much or the necessities that drove them into that decision are now no longer necessities anymore, you know, as those circumstances change, then they get the opportunity to reassess and say, wait a minute, I didn't actually want to be in this career or in this city or have this life. If the crisis leads you to live in greater accordance with your values, then have it. Have the midlife crisis or crises. The cliche of getting a sports car is only off the mark if you don't actually give a shit about sports cars and you're just spending money for the sake of spending it. But if you were the kid who had posters of this sports car on their bedroom wall at the age of eight, and you were the the 20-something who was looking at car feeds on Instagram because you were so into it, and now you're finally getting this thing that you've always wanted, well, I think that's something to celebrate. What if we're OG and we have a, uh, like, you know how most people have a baseball card collection? OG Mm -hmm. has like a financial advisor card collection. He's like, oh, look at that. Oh, my goodness. It's Ray Dalio. It's a Ray Dalio rookie card. But I did the sports car thing. Paula, just like you said, I had this thing in my head that when I turned 40, I would have a race car. The year I turned 40, like it just manifested itself in my life. It sat in my garage for two years and then I sold it because I drove it like a thousand miles in two years. I'm like, this is such a waste of space just literally sitting here. Like, well, so what's the uh, what's the solution, OG? And we'll give our guest of honor the last word here. Well, you have to have bigger goals like an airplane or a jet. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was the problem. I quickly realized like it wasn't... It wasn't motivating enough. <laughs> airplane, or, you know, cars, cars that go like 100 miles an hour, pff, that's Bush League. You need, you need an airplane that goes 200 miles an hour. We need like a backup beep button on this, on this podcast board of ours. Beep, beep. Back off that OG. Too soon? Well, I'm just wondering, what, what, what's the real solution? Well, I, like I said, I think the biggest stuff is, you know, just be happy where you are. And if you're not, uh, if something's not exactly the way that you want it to be, then just change it. You don't have to wait till you're 40 to buy the sports car. Metaphorically, you can do it when you're 35 or 51 or whatever you want to do. Just, just be happy where you are. And if you don't, if you don't, uh, if there's something you don't like, just make it different. I mean, if you're crying out loud, you can do any job you want now from home. So, you know, <laughs> go, go change jobs if that's your thing or whatever. Kathy, you've got the final word. What's our solution? Well, I think that some of us don't really know what it is in our life that's missing. We know that it's something, but we're not sure what it was or what it is. And like with me, I think that art is a big part of it. And this is something that I used to do all the time when I was a child. So if you're having trouble figuring out what it is in your life that's missing, go back to when you were eight or nine years old and figure out what really lit you up then and maybe bring a little bit of that back into your life. Well, if you're new to the show, welcome to our Friday FinTech segment. This is where, as I'm exploring online and I find cool ideas that I didn't know about, we invite them on the show and we learn about them together. So whenever there's a FinTech brand that we highlight here, it's something that I find interesting. We're not endorsing the brand. We're just learning about it together. And I believe that all of these cool ideas that these creators make are so fascinating. Why did the creator come up with the idea? What's the problem they're trying to solve? And really, why aren't some of these bigger companies focusing on these things? So many great ideas. Today, we have another one that I just heard about recently called Public. Public makes investing social. So take your favorite social platform, combine it with a brokerage account, and there you have Public. Let's talk about how it works and learn about public together from a woman who has a name that you might have heard of before. And on my dad's shortwave radio, it's my new friend, Katie Perry. How are you? 
I'm fantastic. Thanks, Joe. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing very well, but there's definitely an elephant in the room. And that's that I've been telling everybody all week that I get to talk to Katy Perry today. And I'm sure that that's like an eye roll thing for you. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. She took my name. Not really. You know, I I really like her. I think she's a brilliant businesswoman and artist. The funny thing is she actually started becoming famous right at the end of when I was at college. And I remember at the time thinking, this will be a one hit wonder. (laughs) Not going to really worry about this. You know, it kind of was, was the joke. And then all of a sudden it was like the second album, the third album, the fourth album. And I was like, all right, this is sticking, but you got to look on the bright side. You know, it's a great icebreaker. Um, And if you got to have your name associated with someone, I think it's good if, you know, you like them and you're a fan. Yeah. And it's funny. Somebody told me that her concert documentary video, I don't know if you've seen it, when she was going through her breakup yes. of her marriage, like I was told that was really good. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to watch a Katy Perry concert video. Just not my thing. But people sat me down in front of the TV. We started watching it. It was amazing. Like that was a fantastic documentary. Yeah, she's super real. Personally, I, I don't know her, obviously. I like her a lot. I would love to meet her someday. <laughs> All right. She well, like a cool person. Y- you are uh, somebody who's famous for something else, and that is being on the public team. Let's talk about uh, when Public was first founded. Tell me the origin story, Public, because I'm always fascinated about how fintech people get these ideas. Yeah. Uh, So Public is a social investing app. So essentially, it means we're registered broker dealer. You can buy and sell fractional shares of thousands of public companies. But in addition to that, there's a social layer. Um, And that social community experience, we really view as a vehicle for education. So being able to get these conversations in the open and talk about businesses with your friends. So facilitating all of those sorts of things. The origin story is actually pretty interesting because it's really a marriage of fintech insiders and outsiders. So some of our, our early investors were the original investors in Venmo. So obviously they have a lot of credibility and experience in the space. We have other investors that are completely plucked from mainstream culture, and that's completely strategic. So Will Smith's Dreamers Fund, Sophia Amoroso, who is the best-selling author and founder of Girlboss, Morgan Debon, who who is the founder and CEO of Blavity Inc. So really, it's this combination of inside perspective and then outsiders. Um, Even in our leadership team, we have two CEOs. One has built and scaled fintech companies and is really deep into that space. The other is a serial entrepreneur and ex-creative director. And so in this blend of kind of the legacy fintech experience with a new perspective is where a lot of interesting things happen. And it lines up perfectly with our mission, which is trying to change the culture of investing. Having that outside perspective really helps. Boy, and you can really see, talk about somebody that's a creative director. You can really see the creativity in just the way that you guys laid out public. Like it, it seems to be very much based on creativity, even though you're helping people learn about something as basic as finance. Yeah. What I love about what we're doing is we're kind of ripping up the playbook. We're not from a product standpoint, a marketing standpoint, we're not looking at necessarily evolving what has always been done. We're kind of trying to just approach it as a blank canvas. And so you see that in the app itself, extremely intuitive. Our members say it feels more akin to other social platforms they use versus feeling like a brokerage experience they would have had. In our marketing, we have a lot of initiatives going on where you might kind of say, I can't believe a fintech company is doing that, yeah. uh, but it makes sense. So just recently, we launched Ticker Tees where you can design your own t-shirt based on the companies you believe in most in your portfolio. And people go nuts for that. And they again, it's like bringing investing into mainstream culture, making it fashionable to be interested in business, all of these things wrapped into one. Um, we're seeing a lot of momentum right now. That's why I really wanted to talk to you was because of the, the the creativity and just how fun it seems. So so let's walk through it. How does this work, Katie? Do I go to the website first yeah. or do, do I go to an app first? Sure. We're a mobile app. If you want to go to public.com, you can you can start the process there or just search us in the, the app store for iOS or Android. Um, and essentially, like when I describe this to people who can't really picture it, is think of us as a mobile app with two facets. One is all of the bells and whistles you'd get from a traditional brokerage account. So ability to view your portfolio performance, 
You can even organize your portfolio in our app by longer term and shorter term investments. And so that's a great built in tool to help people kind of stay focused on their longer term goals. And we're really catering to that longer term investor. And then the other facet is the social layer, which is kind of like where you're learning and having conversations about businesses. And so the feed there looks very similar to what you would see in Venmo. So there's transactions happening. People are buying and selling stocks. No dollar amount shown, which I love. No matter how uh, much money good, you have, good. everyone has a voice in the conversation. You could choose not to share things to the feed, but most people do. And the prompt there is really, why did you do this? And that's where you're unlocking a lot of really great conversations. Why do you believe in Peloton? Or why did you sell Microsoft today? And flowing from those transactions, you get this really constructive conversation that builds in the feed with people talking about business strategy and business trends and not just stock talk. And there's also, in addition to that, a chat function. So one of the things we noticed was, you know, even me myself, I, I'm screenshotting the past, screenshotting positions I have in, in stock charts to my friends on text, sometimes Instagram DM, and it just doesn't make sense. And so we build a chat function where you can actually embed charts. You can tag other investors. You could build group chats with up to 100 people in them and have more targeted conversations. For example, I'm in a future of fitness group chat with about 100 people, and we talk about things like Lululemon buying me or what does it mean for Peloton. Um, and you can kind of have these almost like chat room experiences, which are really great. So again, it's it's the traditional kind of performance stuff that's you know facing the individual user, and then the social feed where you're kind of unlocking ways to build your literacy. Let me ask, man, I have so many questions for you, Katie. The first one, though, is when I first download the app, I may not know anybody yet on the app. So do I see the feed of everybody talking or can I choose certain people to follow or how does it work to get me kind of involved in the community? Yeah, great question. I think uh, similar to sort of like a Pinterest onboarding, we ask you to select a few things you might be interested in. So these could be thematic, uh, could be, you know, cannabis stocks. It could be specific companies like Shopify. It could be personalities. Um, you pick a few of those and then we curate, uh, an opening experience. So you're not just dropped into this solo one player kind of thing where you're just there with your chart and not knowing where to go. You pick and choose some of the things you're interested in and we'll curate that first experience for you. Um, and that's a great way to just get people acclimated with what it means to be a member of our community, um, from the very first day they join. Gotcha. Okay. That's cool. So then from there, obviously, then I make friends with people as I see different people uh, commenting on other people's stuff and I, and I grow that way. IRAs. Can I have my IRA, my Roth IRA in public, or is it going to be just a non, non-qualified brokerage account? Currently, no, no IRAs, just a straight brokerage account. Yeah. Good. So, but I can still use it flexibly for my non-IRA money. I can buy anything. Can I buy exchange traded funds there as well as individual stocks? Yes, we we have fractional shares of public companies as well as a myriad of ETFs, Vanguard, Fidelity, all of the kind of big names you know. And you can also buy into those fractionally, which is great. So I think ETFs are something that people just starting out, they can't really grasp. And that's a great way that a lot of members kind of get started in learning about those. So we offer both. Awesome. And then uh, next question, of course, is the obvious one, I'm sure, Katie, that everybody asks, which is which is fees. What type of fees are there involved with public? Sure. No commission fees on, you know, regular trades. There are some fees for like more sophisticated things you might need or transfers, things like that. But on the day to day transactions were a zero commission trading platform. Okay. And then how do you guys make money the way other brokerages make money by loaning out the positions? Is that how or on the spread or how do you guys make money? Sure. First of all, I love when people ask this because I think it's not just about financial literacy, but digital literacy. And when, when apps are free, I think it's really good to ask that question. And even just growing up in the Facebook kind of first wave of people coming through Facebook, you know, you had people complaining about product updates on Facebook and I'm like, wait a minute, you're not paying for this. Right. Um, so, right. you know, uh, it's kind of funny. So we make money in three ways. Um, the first is pretty straightforward interest on cash balances. 
The second is through securities lending. So our clearing firms connected to a network of investors. We lend them stock to short. Importantly, this doesn't interrupt our members' experience in any way. Sure. And the last one's smart order routing. So the clearing firm directs orders to routing destinations. On certain transactions, we get a rebate from those. And the clearing firm always has to kind of seek the best price for the order, regardless of the rebate. I think kind of pivoting to where we want to go in the future is I could see an environment where there's subscription models in public, where you're paying for different types of experiences in the app, Um, because we're really optimizing for what we call daily active investors, which we define not as trade activity. Um, So an active member for us isn't necessarily someone who's making a ton of transactions. In fact, you can't even day trade on public. It's not it's not allowed. So in, in that longer term mindset, we want people to be engaged in their portfolio. So going back to that kind of two layers, I spend most of my time in the app in the social feed. I'm getting news articles about the company I invest in. I'm in chat groups. I'm engaged in an educational way, not in a I'm super hyperactive with my trade volume way. And so when you think about that, you could see tiers down the line of different types of experiences in the app that people might pay for. That's cool. And on that note, you know, I'm sure you guys aren't just sitting around with your feet up, like happy with where you're at. There's got to be something you're working on right now. You and I both know, Katie, nobody listens to the show. So it's just you and I, a couple friends (laughs) chatting. Any secret stuff coming up that you can maybe drop here? Tell me a little bit about uh, where you guys are headed next. Sure. Well, we have two amazing product leads that I do not want to put our friendship into question, (laughs) Uh, but I can speak more broadly. I think we're really doubling down on the social community features. I mean, we have seen that even going back to March with peak volatility in the market, we saw people spending twice as much time in the app. There was like a 70% increase in social interactions. And what we saw was when things are uncertain or moving around more, people want to have that social experience and they're really learning a lot from other people in the community. And so we're really focused on building tools to make that social layer even more souped up, more things that people can use to share ideas and double down there. Because again, that's where people are really building their financial literacy. And I think when people are just starting out, in addition to having the frictionless intuitive experience, there needs to be things in the app that allow them to learn and grow as an investor. And so that's what we're really passionate about building right now. It's called public. You can find it at public.com in the app store on Google play. We'll have a link to it on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Katie, thanks for hanging out for a few minutes and talking public with us and social investing. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Be sure to get my new album. I'm sure I have one. Hey, trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And did you know that on this date in history, Caleb Bradham changed the name of his very own drink concoction from Brad's drink to one you might recognize today called Pepsi Cola. That's right. Had he not changed it, you could be drinking Brad's drink right now. But Caleb believed the drink was more than a refreshment when he created it, thinking that it was a healthy cola aiding in digestion, so he called it Pepsi, as an offshoot of the word dyspepsia, meaning indigestion. I'm an expert on that, (laughs) but I don't know about Pepsi being healthy. This whole story does remind me of a little something I've been cooking up for a while now. But before I tell you about that, let's get to today's trivia. In what year did Brad's drink become Pepsi Cola? I'll be back faster than you can get your bubbly on. All right. Well, for those of you new to the Stacking Benjamin Show, every Friday between our three contributors, we have a year-long competition going on. And man, has the race tightened the score as of this recording. OG has 11. Len has 11. And if you haven't been around for a while this year, you might have thought Paula was trailing by a lot. And she's roared back over the course of the last couple months And Paula has 10. But Paula, because you're still one off the lead, that means you get to decide first. Do you want to guess first in the middle or last? I will guess last. Huh, that is strange. And Kathy, being the guest, will let you go next. Would you like to guess uh, first or in the middle? Oh, I think I'll take the middle. Wow, not her first rodeo either, (laughs) even though it's her first time on the show. 
So that means, OG, you're kicking it off here. What year did Brad's drink become Pepsi Cola? This is a great question. So think about like Coca Cola. And I feel like Coke's been around for the better part of 100 years, maybe even longer. I think we did that. Did we do the Coca-Cola question, Paula? It seems like we have, didn't we? I, I think we, I remember mm -hmm. talking about the Coca-Cola Museum, but I think it was a really obscure question, like how many bags of popcorn could fit inside? <laughs> yeah. The, the Coca-Cola yeah. Museum? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something like that, yeah. But I feel like it's got to be like 150 some odd years old. Brad, it's not a name that's old. You don't hear of like King Brad, you know, from Mesopotamia <laughs> or something like there's, there's not like a, there's, there's not like, well, there were King Edward, then King George, and then a couple of King Brad's, you know, so, so it doesn't, it seems like a very contemporary. Name, well, but, well, but just to be, just to be fair, cause as always, OG, you were zoning out while Doug was reading. Uh, the guy's name was Caleb Bradham and he called it Brad's drink. Ah, I see. So his name was actually well, Caleb. Caleb. Is a pretty old name then. <laughs> Maybe like the third name ever or fourth name <laughs> of, all, of all names. I guess Caleb is pretty old. Uh, okay. So that pretty much puts us from the beginning of time. Uh, shoot. So I think Pepsi came after Coke. Although it wouldn't surprise me if Coke came after Pepsi and just did a better job of marketing. Or had a better product. Oh, True. man. We, uh, uh, Kathy, which one do you like? in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Pepsi came around in uh, 1911. 1911. Kathy, what do you think about that? Well, I'm a Coke girl. You know, I actually got into a lot of trouble with my cousin i thought you were gonna say we had <laughs> Pepsi, <laughs> not that kind of coke i think you're gonna say with who, coke i'm like no wrong show Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> wrong show my cousin actually had pepsi tattooed on her body somewhere and i have a coke machine a 1954 coke machine that i've been schlepping around with me for i don't want to tell you how many years but now that og gave his guess. Now I'm second guessing myself, but I, this is just for Len. So who cares? <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. I'm going to say 1899. 1899. Wow, Paula, that gives you a wide moat between the two. It sure does. So essentially my guess is, do I think it's earlier than 1899? Do I think it's in that interim period in between, or do I think it's after 1911? I'm going to guess that I think that it is after 1911. When I heard the question, the first number that popped into my head was 1924. But of course, for the sake of strategy, that means that I must guess 1912. <laughs> Isn't there a war? 1912? I think it's 1812. It was 1812. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> kind of like my guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going to, on that historical moment, uh, we would love to tell you which answer is right, but of course we got to make you wait. So we will be right back. Bonjour. Welcome to French Made Easy with me, your host, Mathilde. Today, I'm joined by certified financial planner Devin Carroll, and together we will share a popular and simple French phrase so you too can use it in your own life. Sound easy? Sure. Today's phrase is valuable when you see a woman named Sally. Say this, Sally, can I store my gold in your doomsday bunker? In French, you would say this popular phrase just like this. Sally, est-ce que je peux ranger mon or dans ton bunker anti-fin du monde? Once again, Sally, est-ce que je peux ranger mon or dans ton bunker anti-fin du monde? Now, let's hear certified financial planner Devin Carroll try it. Ready, Devin? Okay, yes. Sally? Est-ce que de ranger monodons ton bunker en ta fin du monde? Oh yeah, I know that for sure. Perfect. See how we sound almost exactly alike? You two can speak French easily and comfortably listening to Stacking Benjamins. See you next time. Au revoir. Kathy, you have the longest time ago guess at 1899, so... I don't know. You feeling good about that? 
I don't know. I'm sweating here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, buddy. Let's oh, see. <laughs> OG, you've got 1911, uh, which means what does that give you? Uh, like 1905 to 1911. That's a six year period. Yeah, not feeling too good, but we'll see how it goes. Paula, 1912 and after, if it was created just before Michael Jackson did those videos where he, what, lit his hair on fire, you're good. I'm not familiar with the videos, but I do think I'm good. <laughs> that is so weird. <laughs> Obviously, she's not familiar with one of the single most iconic I, issues I, of the 1980s ever. I saw the thriller video, but I don't think there's any hair on fire there. There is but no. But you do know who he is. I do know who he is. I think Thriller is the only one of his videos that I've seen, though. It was oh, in boy. Video, it was a commercial. Hmm. Well, his hair got well, caught on fire. Yeah, we're not talking the about the the, uh, the the video, though. But yes, his hair caught oh. on fire while he was filming a Pepsi commercial. Oh, I'm, I was. So I missed that whole thing. I was unfamiliar with that piece of news. That is so surprising. Paul is <laughs> like, really? Tell me more about that. Right. All right, Doug, uh, is it, is Paula closer with 1912, OG 1911, Kathy with 1899? Doug, you got it from here. What's our answer? Hey, stackers, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And you know, I think now's probably a great time to tell you about this idea I've had swirling around in the back of my brain. And that, this week, I've commandeered Joe's mom's kitchen to create since this whole Brad's drink, a.k.a. Pepsi, worked out pretty darn well for Brad, I think it's high time we had some innovation in soft drinks. So how about Doug's drink? Hey, I got to warn you before you taste it, though. This is amazing in almost every way. I figured out just the right amount of sugar, added a pinch of caramel, thrown in lots of high fructose corn syrup. Since corn's a vegetable and vegetables are good for you, duh. And, uh, and, and this is a kicker. I've even added my secret ingredient, just a little hint of lime. But between us, Doug's drink is just missing that big kick. I've been racking my brain all morning, and now I really think I need a chemical reaction to help put this over the edge. There's not a whole lot to work with here, but like Thomas Edison, I'm an experimenter, so I found some bleach and some vinegar, and I'm thinking maybe I can combine those two chemicals for that little extra. While I'd never drink anything without testing it first, I could just mix them in with the rest of my drink and see how it goes. Uh, but before I go off for my genius scientific experiment, let's get back to today's trivia. The question was this, in what year was Pepsi-Cola officially named? One of America's most beloved soft drinks went from being Brad's drink to Pepsi Cola all the way back in 1898. That is a long time ago, which means America's due for another soft drink hit. Time to go make history with Doug's drink. See ya! Whoa! <laughs> Oh, I feel much better about that. Now, Len's not going to come after me. I <laughs> thought I thought you were going to say you feel much better about Pepsi now. You're like, I no. can get rid of that Coke machine now that I know all about Pepsi. No way. No one, way. One year away. That, that's one of the, oh, gee, that's one of the closest guesses we've had. It's pretty good, yeah. Do I win something? Uh, yes. Admiration. If, if, <laughs> imagine if I had guessed on that side rather than the other. You were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a heck of a, a heck of a show. Doug had told me on a post-it note what the uh, answer was. And when you were sitting debating, I'm like, she might get this right on. <laughs> but See, here's what I did when you wrote it or when you said it, I wrote it on a piece of paper. 1899. Whoa. Well, congratulations. And that puts uh, Len hey, slash two now, right? Kathy in the lead. Uh, nope has 12. You've got 11 and Paula's oh, got 10. One. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, let's take out the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. You know what happens, Kathy, when you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money? You find the best bed that you can buy. <laughs> that is, the, you've been listening to a lot of podcasts, <laughs> <laughs> especially if you think mattresses and podcasts, right? No, you find when you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money that those financial products 
you got it, your brick and mortar bank, they're probably nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of those financial things use like checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, credit cards, consolidation loans. They're all ranked head to head against each other at Magnify Money. Go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for more. And today we're going to help our new friend, Martin, magnify his money. Say hi, Martin. Hey, Joe and OG, first time caller, first time listener. I'm 17 years old, and here's my question. After listening to your episode with Craig Curlop, I've really been interested in getting into house hacking, but due to my young age, I don't think I can do that right now. I don't have a great lump sum of money, but what are some things I can do right now that'll help me generate a good amount of income besides side hustles and things like that? I've been looking into stocks with the Motley Fool. I would just like to know what are some other things I can be doing right now? What are some ways that I can have my money work for me? What are some things that I can do right now? Thank you very much. And just thank you. Thank you. I I was so waiting for the t-shirt size. Weren't you? I was just waiting. <laughs> and I'm an extra medium. Uh, extra medium. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the shirts that Joe wears. But yes, yes. I'm not medium. I'm extra medium. Thanks for the call, Martin. And congratulations on, on the hustle. That's fantastic. Wanting to learn as much as possible and fantastic that you want to do that. For people that didn't hear Craig Curlop when he was on the show, we'll link to that episode on our show notes page at Stacky Benjamins. But uh, just so people know, Craig is a guy who is also a hustler like Martin he bought a house and he rents every room in his house and sleeps on the sofa. Uh, he did that for a while. He rented his car to people so they could take his car and go places. If Craig owned something, in fact, it's funny that the guy who created uh, bigger pockets where Craig worked for a long time, Josh Dorkin told me, Josh said that if somebody would rent Craig's underwear, he would rent it to them. Because Craig was always thinking about ways to make money. So that gives you a little background on, on Craig Curlop. But let's start with you, Kathy. What are some things you think that Martin could be doing to make a little more money? Well, first of all, Martin, congratulations on thinking about this at age 17. If you continue with this thought process, you'll be okay no matter what. But there really wasn't a lot of information in the call. So, I mean, I, I have a lot of questions like... How much money do you have? What is your timeline? What's the money for? Are you in school, high school, college? Do you live with your parents? There's just so many questions. It's really hard for me to give you advice. But my advice would be figure out how much money you need to live on. And whether that's food, rent, whatever, or if you live with your parents, it's probably zero, or maybe it just might be your cell phone and maybe your transportation costs, but figure that out. And then make an agreement with yourself to take some figure, and I don't care what it is. When I was younger, it was 10%. Now, it seems like everybody's saving 50% of their money, but I thought I was doing good way back, way back then, <laughs> doing 10%. And honestly, I really don't care what you do with it. You could put in a savings account. The point is right now to build that savings and investment muscle. Then whether you invest in an index fund, a mutual fund, something that you heard about on that show you were talking about, or save it up to purchase a house so you can do a house hack, well, that's up to you. It really doesn't matter as much how you invest in that you do invest in your future. You focus on getting the money socked away. That's right. Yeah. And... If you live with your parents, why don't you ask them if they'll let you rent your room out and then you sleep on the couch? <laughs> That's great. He goes from zero rent living with mom and dad. <laughs> like, who is this? Uh, this is my friend, uh, Bob. Uh, who's, who's Bob? And the guy's like, my name's not Bob. It's Jim. Whatever. My friend, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Paula. Well, he could rent out a stacking Benjamin's t-shirt. Size <laughs> <Right>? extra medium. <laughs> He probably could. Gertrude's going to send Martin one. So, by the way, Paul, I like the fact that he's not just a first-time caller. He's first-time listener. Did you hear that? Oh, I did not. I didn't notice that. So, a couple of things that I would say. First of all, I don't know. Uh, what, what was his name? Martin. His name is 
Martin. Martin, I don't know if you're planning on going to college or not. Certainly, it's not a necessity for everybody. If you are planning on going to college and if you are still in high school, one opportunity that you have that would allow you to save a whole bunch of money over the, the next few years is while you're in high school, you can take the AP exam. And if you get a passing mark on the AP exams, you can then test out of or be exempt from those credits in college. So you could take AP history, AP chemistry, AP biology, AP English, uh, AP Spanish, and get credits for those classes. And what's cool is that as long as you're still in high school, you don't actually have to take the AP class. You can just buy the book, study it on your own, and take the exam. You can also do, you need to be in high school in order to be able to take the AP exams, but even if you are no longer in high school, you can take what's called the CLEP exam, C-L-E-P, and that's another way to test out of courses. So one of, at the age of 17, if college is in your future, one of the big, big net worth improving activities that you can do is test out of as much college as possible so that you have to pay for fewer semesters. Here is uh, what Craig Curlop would do, Paula, if, if mom and dad are paying Martin's entire expense, if Martin's going to college and they're mm -hmm. paying the entire expense, sit down with mom and dad, don't tell them any of the stuff Paula said, and just say, listen, if I can save you some money on my college, can we just split it 50-50? So you get some mm -hmm. and I also get some. And mom mm -hmm. and dad say, sure, and then have them hand you half the cash that you saved them by taking the AP classes. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. If your parents are, are planning on paying for your tuition, that is a big win. That's a win-win for both of you. Absolutely. They'll be like, you kidding me? You're saving me money? Yes, I will. I can, I can yeah. figure out a way. Just split yeah. it with me. Yes. Make money off mom and dad. That's the key to this show. <laughs> <laughs> really what it is, it's negotiate deals. You know, negotiate deals that are a win-win for both parties. That's the lesson here. That that actually is the lesson. But I but I also like the fact that he's learning about investments at age 17. Mm -hmm. I would say that maybe starting with the Motley Fool and individual stocks might not be the the perfect starting point. But I also think that if you're going to do the individual stock game, that doing it at 17 is probably the right time. Yeah, although I, I would, since he did say that he's a first-time listener, I'd encourage him to listen to more Stacking Benjamins or the Afford Anything podcast um, <laughs> and, uh, and and learn more about the world of investing before he goes into it. But the, the other thing is, it's great that he has this interest in investing, but your contributions are the single biggest determinant of your investing success. And your contributions come from your ability to save and your yeah. savings come from your ability to earn. And at 17, I'm going to guess he does not have high earnings or a high hourly rate right now at this age, if he's like most 17 year olds. And so for him to focus on how he can make money, which was the initial part of his question, I think that there's much more opportunity there than there is for him to learn about investing. And so I think the focus on how can I make money, whether that's starting an online business, flipping stuff on eBay, or learning a skill that he can sell as a freelancer or as a consultant, like graphic design or programming, some type of online entrepreneurship activity that he can do from home on his own time, ideally something in which he's developing a skill, which will then last him for the rest of his life and be something marketable, you know, and he can then work some type of service-based self-employed kind of gig. I think that's a great way to make money and the investing can come later. It's funny. This is why I think, Kathy, what you said was so important that just building that muscle of saving money is is so, so, so important. And Paula, I agree with you. I know he said he didn't want to do side hustles, but I'll tell you, the guests we've had on this show, the one thing that these people have in common that are really successful is that they're hustlers, is that they know how to hustle. And they've learned at such a quick pace that by the time a lot of people, by the time they were in their late 20s, they had failed so many times at so many different things and they'd learned which things work and which things don't that it really helped them. So I know, Martin, you said you don't want to do side hustles. I would say, man, at 17, let's get that train rolling. But OG, mm -hmm. what do you think, man? I was thinking about this from a little bit different perspective, which is to avoid mistakes along the way. You know, between now and let's say 30 is probably the time where while you, you have the opportunity to experiment with side hustles and doing all the good things with money, you also have the opportunity to get into a lot of trouble. 
you know, you've, Paula was talking about saving money in college costs. So one big thing that people get in trouble with is just boatloads of college debt or student loan debt. Uh, if you join the military and you say, well, I'm just going to go buy a, a new Mustang because everybody on base has one of those. And then they put you on a boat and you don't get to see your Mustang for six months at a time, but yet you got to pay the payments on it. it. You get in trouble when you get into credit card debt or you start a job after college, let's say, and the first thing you do is go buy a house as opposed to, you know, maxing out your retirement plans and your HSAs and that sort of thing. So Kathy was talking about this in terms of building that muscle or that discipline. All of that is, is really important. Uh, and I think in, in addition to that, try to stay out of trouble. You know, don't get into credit card debt. There's no hurry for that. Everybody in your, and their mother will tell you, hey, you should get a credit card at 18 to build credit history. Okay, sure. For what, though? If you don't need to borrow any money, you don't need a credit card for now. Resist the temptation to spend money frivolously and to rack up piles and piles of student loan debt. And if you can manage to get through the next four or five years, if college is your plan and you can get four or five years down the road and you graduate and you have very limited or no uh, college debt, or you don't have any credit card debt, and then you get that job and uh, that job's paying 50 grand a year. And the first thing that you do isn't move out of your college apartment and buy a Mercedes on a lease, but instead max out your 401k, max out your HSA, and then build your life from that. You'll be so much further ahead that everyone else in, in 15 years from now that it won't matter, you know, whether or not you got every little I dotted and T crossed because you'll be you'll be uh, saving tons of money. Just like Paula said, that's kind of a big determinant there. I love that advice. I remember when I've spoken at high schools and done Q and A's with people that are juniors and seniors in high school, I swear nearly every single question I get is a form of how can I get into tons of debt really, really quickly and screw up my future? But like, they're not asking that specifically. It's how do I get a car loan? How do I buy a house right out of high school? Yeah. How do I get my credit card? Like no questions about saving like Martin is, it's all questions about how do I really dig a hole so that I'm going to spend the rest of my twenties and maybe a lot of my thirties trying to dig my way out. Well, it's not a bad thing to go buy a house right out of high school, you know, but you got to do it with the right information. You have to do it with the right amount of money down to be buying a house with 1% down because you can barely qualify for it. Or do but, it the way Craig Curlop did where he's renting out every stinking room of the house. Yeah. Well, that's a way to do it. But I bet you also Craig put 20 or 30% down on his house and you got to give yourself that margin of error. You can't, you can't day one be up to your eyeballs and in, in leverage. It just, it's very seductive. And as you know, and I know the backside of that is a 15 year fix. Yeah. You know, you go, it's easy to get into $200,000 of debt. That's super easy. Getting out of it takes, you know, a decade and a half. Don't do that. And you'll be way ahead. Thanks for the question, Martin. If you've got a question for us and you just have, a, you know, your phone has a microphone, your computer has a microphone, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail and uh, ask our panel a question. And like Martin, because you're brave, Gertrude from our team will send you a Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt. That's going to do it for today, guys. What a fun, fun episode we just had. Let's, uh, we'll talk about what our guest of honor is up to last. So why don't we start OG with you? What do you got going on this weekend, man? Oh, let's see here. Nothing too exciting this weekend because we've got a later Labor Day. So just another routine weekend of nothing. Yeah, there's, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing special. I like these kind of last hurrah weekends, but I do wish there was, uh, you know, um, a little more football going on, but maybe another well, year. Yeah. yeah. Um, Only in 365 days. Paula, how about you? Are you in the middle of uh, moving undisclosed locations during this uh, particular time? <laughs> well, um, what I can tell you is that on the Afford Anything podcast, which is always in the same place, which is at your favorite podcast player, our good friend Andy Hill joins me. Oh, um, Andy so Hill. Yeah, Andy Hill. He's from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast. He has been on Stacking Benjamins many times. You might recognize that name. And he joins me to talk about advice for parents who are dealing with a school year that is very different than any school year that they've ever dealt with before. So what do you do if you're a parent, particularly if, uh, in his case, he's an entrepreneur, he works from home, how can he manage and you know, what advice does he have for other parents who are trying to manage working from home while simultaneously having young kids who are going to school from home? 
So he joins me on the Afford Anything podcast to talk about that. Andy's the perfect person to talk about that topic. Just great. And man, do I miss having Andy down this. Andy used to be my neighbor for people who don't know. And uh, we'd have game nights together all the time. And I miss those. Of course, game nights ended before I left uh, the Detroit area because of COVID. But um, at some point they were hopefully coming back. Kathy, it's about time we finally got you on the show. I'm so glad this has been really fun. Yeah. Well, let's talk about what's happening at Rock Your Retirement. Well, I will be preparing for the release of my new format, which we scheduled to start September 1st. But since my show usually comes out on a Monday, I'll probably release it on August 31st. Ah, so the people might is, be in luck for Monday, but also they can go back and listen to a bunch of great stuff on the old format show. They can, uh, anything from all, we had all kinds of things. We've got reinventing life after grief scammers. You know, everybody's trying to scam people who are over 60 military transitions with your friend, Doug Nordman. That was way early at episode 59. Just lots of things. I My show, I've always considered it to be like an encyclopedia. People don't listen to every episode. They find an episode that they're interested in, and they listen to that one. Yeah, and episodes are all over the place, from 15 minutes to uh, nearly an hour long. So you get a whole different treat every time. We do. We we try to shoot for 20, but it is it just goes where it goes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> This goes wherever. We will link, by the way, to Rocky Retirement on our show notes page, along with uh, Ford Anything on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our roundtable. There is a cure for the midlife crisis, and here it is. Focus less time on looking back and more on goals you don't just check off your list. This will help you to spend your time focusing on what lies ahead rather than all the things you've accomplished that are behind you. Second, take a lesson from our Friday FinTech. Want to get into trading? Start off by surrounding yourself with others who enjoy investing like you do. While you want to keep a long-term perspective, it's fun and interesting to see how others are also growing their stack. But the big takeaway... Did you know that when you mix bleach and vinegar, you get a chlorine gas? Yeah, and neither did I. I may or may not have discovered that on Joe's mom's porch. Uh, I guess that gave me a little bit more than the kick I was bargaining for. (coughs) Stay safe, kids. Let pros like me try this stuff. Yeah, just sit back and wait for Doug's (laughs) Doug's drink. I'll get there. Big thanks to Kathy for joining us on the round table today. <coughs> you can find Kathy at the Rock Your Retirement podcast or at MedicareQuick.com. We'll have a link on our show notes page at stacking <coughs> oh, woo, stackingbenjamins.com. Wow, that stuff's potent. Also, big thanks to Katy Perry from Public to show us we can own a piece of any stock on the stock market. You can find out more on how you can own your own piece of the pie at public.com. We will also have a link on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Paula Pant appears courtesy of affordanything.com and the Afford Anything podcast. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Okay, I've sat here trying to think of something pleasant to say after that, and I can't.